Hello, everyone. I'm really, really, really excited to have the opportunity to interview such a majestic person who's been such a thought leader for us in the, in the cloud world. One of the big themes that we talked about today was the interplay between framework, tools, and cloud infrastructure. Something else that's on a lot of our minds is the shift towards composable architectures, where you have a set of front-end applications that act as microservices that talk to the global ecosystem of API services, headless platforms, headless e-commerce, headless CMS. And sometimes we have to walk through and go through the journey of how this all fits together. So I'm incredibly excited to invite Kelsey Hightower on stage to talk about all the lessons learned from the beginnings of the cloud to now at the edge with Vercel. Thank you. Thank you, Kelsey. So I'm pretty sure some of y'all might be curious, like what is this back-end Kubernetes guy doing <laughs> at a front-end conference? And that's the same question I asked when I became an advisor for Vercel, like where is the connection here? And you know, I work in cloud predominantly, and when you think about the fundamentals, I always remember there being this hard decision that most people felt they had to make. Do you take your entire application and stuff it onto a server or a VM or a container? Even in the serverless, people still have this kind of idea. Should I be serving static content? Hopefully you're not doing that in 2022. CDNs are a thing. You can push your images there. But we still haven't answered this question for your compute logic itself. Where should you do that login? Where should you serve that personalized profile? And so even in the world where we have VMs, containers, and serverless, that's still a messy question for a lot of people. So diving into Next.js and seeing that question attempt to be answered in the framework itself was super intriguing to me because I've seen all this before. On the server side or in storage systems, I remember being very clear about tiered architectures. I don't know if some of y'all are old as I am, but when I started in, in computing, uh, we only had spinning disks, like actual hard drives. We had floppy disks too, that's a thing. But when SSDs came out, they were super expensive and you didn't have much memory in the system, but to make these systems scale, because everyone wanted their storage fast, we decided to come out with tiered architectures. How much of my data can I put in memory? Then if I had a few SSDs or some small amount of SSD space, I would have an SSD there and I would store things that are gonna be next up. But things I haven't accessed to in a while, you put those on spinning disks. Here's the problem, and this is why I thought Next.js was super interesting. You need an operating system that hides all of that complexity. What you want is something that just says, store this file and decide what's the appropriate tier in which to store it. And I think this is what Next.js is trying to do. And the last thing I'll say here is, in the cloud business, we ask this question or we have this notion that the data center is the computer, but now that we look at the big landscape, the web is the computer. So what's its operating system going to be? And that's why I'm an advisor to Vercel. Yeah, I love the concept of the tiered architecture because even peeling back the, to the beginning of Next.js, right? We, we said this, this framework is gonna focus on server rendering. And then we realized that the story gets more complicated than just saying like, I have a server and it renders. So we started confronting these issues of how do you make that scale? How do you bring it as close as possible to the user? The interplay between static and dynamic has started to come up a lot over the years because to your point about storage, there are parts of that dynamic server rendered application that can be optimized. And the question of location always comes up. If I'm server rendering, how can I do that as close as possible to the user? The tiered metaphor I love because when we introduced middleware into Next.js, so a lot of folks reacted with like, what is this middleware thing? <laughs> Um, it, remind, it reminded me personally of Express Middleware. That's where kind of the name came from, where you have a server and you say, I'm gonna have a middleware function that runs for every request. Very simple. Many, many, many different frameworks and, and technologies have done this in the past. So what's, we talk a lot about developer experience, and in Next.js, the dev server feels very monolithic on your local machine, right? Like you have localhost 3000, you send a request, it hits the middleware if it's there, and then it hits your entry point page, and then you render some HTML. Now when you deploy on Vercel, that middleware becomes 
edge middleware by default. So now we put that logic at the edge of the network. And this is not just a cosmetic advantage. This is the, literally the difference between pushing policy, authentication, redirections, routing rules as close as possible to the end user. So we're, what we're seeing, I think, is that we're decomposing what in the past was this monolithic front end, or even monolithic front end and back end architecture into tiers and layers of services. And it's really exciting to see this play out in the beginnings of the cloud, as well as even for ourselves, the journey of Next.js since 2016. And my, and my guess is that this architecture is only possible because we've, we've been in this world for a long time. We've had CDNs, you throw your images there, you can stream things from there. But then there's something different in the Vercel world. I don't know, and I'm curious to know, having your own infrastructure, is this where you get the idea that you can actually host not just images, but logic, yep. and run it safely on the edge? Like, why now? I think, well, first of all, incredible question, because why now? I mean, this sounds so good. It almost sounds too good to be true, right? Like, oh, I can put my computer everywhere. And uh, we've all heard all the memes around, well, 100 millisecond faster website, 8% conversion on, uh, rate um, hike on mobile devices. So if it's so obvious, why haven't we been computing at the edge of the network forever? I think it's been a couple things. So number one is the progression that you talked about from mainframe to bare metal to VMs to containers to now functions and workers. So compute and virtualization is becoming more granular. The, te the technique when we deploy an edge middleware to Vercel, it becomes this edge uh, worker function that is incredibly fast to start up. So anywhere in the world, we can spin up compute on demand truly at, at the speed of static. We, we say it a lot, but uh, now we have customers repeat it back to ourselves. They're like, how can you be running compute so fast that previously wasn't there? And this is the other challenge when we think about going global. What does it mean to go global? Uh, I mean, US West, US East, EU West. Am I also in Sao Paulo? Am I also in Bahrain? Am I also in uh, Seoul? So with Vercel, we go as global as possible, as aggressively as possible, but now we don't have all the compute running everywhere at all times. It would be too expensive. Uh, it would be uh, too stateful as well, which is kind of contrary to the idea of serverless is that things are spinning up and down and then scaling back to zero. So innovations in infrastructure, like the idea of using the V8 isolate as a unit of compute, this trajectory of the, the momentum of compute becoming more granular has given us uh, the, the necessary tailwinds to be able to do this. But the other one that I think doesn't get discussed as much is the innovations in compilers, right? Like the announcements around TurboPack today We've been working so much and so precisely on the technologies to bundle code, to code split. So when, we, when Next.js first came out, we said, each page on your pages directory is going to act like a PHP file. Like your web root, you throw files or CGI bin, and then they, they execute on demand, right? But the other really interesting piece is that we realized at that point that each of these entry points in that directory could be independent functions. So when you deploy them on Vercel, they become this sharded infrastructure. So the benefit there is not just the uh, isolation, that you get better fault tolerance. If a function crashes, it doesn't impact the other one. Functions can scale independently. Secrets and environment can be confined to that quote unquote PHP file, to that entry point of your system. But also the bundling. It was very necessary to have very intelligent code split splitting technologies and the origin of that was that we didn't want to ship JS, a lot of JS to the client. When I first introduced Next.js, I, I remember saying, so if you ship this page and your team is growing and they're working a lot on like the pricing page, slash pricing, the amount of JS that we ship to the client from that page should not impact me who is working on slash settings for my, for my user preferences. Uh, so taking that idea now to the server side and to the edge, we can produce very granular bundles of compute. So combine the V8 isolate starting up really fast with the bundle of compute that gets dispatched to the edge being very minimalistic. We're talking bytes, kilobytes. So compute becoming very granular, miniaturized in some ways. Like it's just becoming so small and so fast to start up 
that now we can push the dynamism to the edge of the network and empower things that weren't possible before. Yeah, so I, I was thinking, like, coming from the back-end world, when I think about this, why now in 2022, when Go, the programming language, come out, very different than JavaScript, even though you can now have Go target WASM, there was this big movement of, like, how can Go claim to be a systems programming language? It isn't low to the metal. It has automatic garbage collection. People are like, hey, you all are missing it. But when you step back, I think when we think about systems, and if we're really being honest around, if the web is really becoming the computer, then the concept of HTTP being the most dominant protocol, even new databases, you talk to them via HTTP. We're not creating custom binary protocols as much as we used to back in the past. And so now that everything speaks this common layer, it only makes sense that this new computer, having HTTP be the default, I don't know if you all checked in a while, but your 5G on your phone is like massive speed increase that you can make all these latency as assumptions, especially if you have CDNs everywhere. So I think HTTP played a big role, and you called out the number one, which is the amount of computing you have to do in that world, V8 is enough. Yeah, I love this because we're talking about the web eating the cloud or the web really becoming the dominant operating system for everything, service to service and service to client, right? It's just becoming so dominant as a, as a mainstream medium. The service to service part is fascinating because you touched on, we're seeing all this new generation of databases that are saying, well, we just speak HTTP and you can fetch them from these modern runtimes like the Edge runtime over the Fetch API. In fact, we have several folks here, partners of Vercel, that are, that are having us think more about data than databases because they're giving us these data APIs. They're very easy to use. They, they are optimized. The one that I'm really excited about too is that just like we're focusing on this super, super, super fast cold start time for this dynamic compute on demand, we're seeing the same with HTTP3. We're talking about like zero RTT resumption. We're talking about the fact that it can coalesce round trips that before were spent on TLS and several, several layers, right? Like the layers are coalescing. So it's almost like the web is optimizing and continue to optimize on every layer for nothing was there before. We're starting from scratch. But even when starting from scratch in that initial request or connection, everything is still instantaneous. So it's happening on the networking layer, it's happening on the compute layer. And I think frameworks are the driving force because thinking about all these requirements and thinking about assembling all these pieces of infrastructure, I'm curious how, what your perspective, Kelsey, is from coming from the Kubernetes world. It can be quite a challenge to align all these pieces perfectly. And I'm curious how you see the world of serverless and edge computing bringing um, you know, ease, to, ease of use or, or what we like to think of the shift from operations to developer experience? Well, I think, honestly, when we hear names like Kubernetes or Next.js, I always think about what patterns are we capturing and giving names to. Just to simplify it, right? Ideally, you could just write JavaScript by hand. I tried. I used to struggle back in the day of like centering the web page. <laughs> that was the moment that I knew I was a back-end engineer. I just couldn't do it. <laughs> I can't center a web page. I still struggle without Tailwind. And so I think now when we see all of these patterns, so in the Kubernetes world, the way I try to explain what Kubernetes is, right, we have this distributed system, but it's a very opinionated one. We didn't build a system for Java, for Ruby on Rails, for Node.js. We built one for applications, and part of that is an opinion that you must put it in a container image. And this is like we're seeing now with these other frameworks that are saying it must target WASM. Once we have these things, then we can actually put security boundaries under a known foundation. And so the next thing we did, and I think this is the same thing that I see in the Next.js framework, some of these patterns are really hard to figure out. Like how do you scale a collection of machines over multiple zones or regions? And then how do you hook up a load balancer to target them and then remove backends when they're no longer healthy? This is hard. Some people know how to do it. The last decade, we've seen an explosion of people coming together, even competitors, working on the same project and then those projects tend to have names. So when I think about Kubernetes, it's just a checkpoint on the stuff we were doing a decade ago, but now it's there by default. So I'll leave, I think of um, Next.js as this like web framework, Kubernetes is an infrastructure framework. So they just give you patterns, and at the end of the day, it serves up data. Now I have a question for you, because going through this tiered architecture, I'm always asking this question, where does the data live? Great Where's question. that system of record? Where am I putting my, are y'all running Oracle? In Vercel, what are we doing? Oracle at the edge, coming today. 
to ever. Trademark. Say don't, don't, no. <laughs> Sorry, Larry, it's not happening. Um, so this is the perennial problem that I'm really excited about all of us collectively solving because specifically I started with the example of middleware because middleware tends to be fairly stateless. So when we were chatting before, we talked about how cool it is that I can decode a JWT at the edge, make a decision early on, look at the uh, arbitrary uh, key value store, and bring a lot of value to that you know, battle to bring the milliseconds down. I can make, start making decisions earlier. But my ability to make a decision early in that pipeline is a function of the availability of data. If it's stateless, it's super easy, right? Like, I can write middleware that strips a trailing slash. Cool. Instead of going all the way to the origin to strip the trailing slash, I can now do it at the edge of the network. And because it's integrated into Next.js, I can run it locally. I can replay it. I have confidence. It's a universal standard. I can ship it. And Vercel optimizes it at the edge and whatnot. The next thing is, okay, I want to do more interesting things. I want to bring data in. So the example that I'm really excited about is with React Server Components and with the ability for React to stream, we can start giving you parts of the UI as they become available. So Brendan Eich was at, um, was at the conference today during the keynote, and, and he had this really cool tweet saying, in 1997, I gave a presentation at a Java conference talking about the concept of streaming UX with JavaScript. I think even back then, it was becoming obvious to, to folks at Netscape and other companies that you know, JavaScript is so quick and it's so easy to hop on an HTTP stream. The, the next obvious thing that you're going to do is that you're going to start streaming parts of the UI. So for us, that means if the data can get closer to the edge, either in the form of cached data, because that's, that's a really interesting point you made, if my uh, source of truth, if my system of record is in US East 1, which is going to happen a lot in the coming years, and I haven't been able to replicate it out yet, either because I, I don't use Google's spanner or because of um, financial reasons, regulatory reasons, et cetera, that's where it is, I can still benefit from the edge being able to start that stream early. The edge might have static portions of the UI. The edge might be able to start sending down instructions for preloading things on the client side. The edge might be able to flush the layout that matches the intended UI. This is really cool because sometimes you can just give the illusion of speed in the form of placeholders or skeletons as soon as the uh, user hits the edge, which can be in 10 milliseconds. Um, when I use messenger.com, I notice that they give me this perfect skeleton of, you know, there's a uh, left-hand side bar with suspended icons, then there is my conversation list with suspended threads, and then there is the chat message. That can be flushed instantaneously from the edge. We continue to be in the domain of stateless compute. Now, what happens when you start merging content? Later today, we have conversations with folks like Sanity. They're building headless CMS technology. What if I can now start streaming the parts of my application that are rich in content from the edge as well? Because the pattern of eventual consistency tends to fit the content uh, decisions fairly well, right? Like the marketing taglines, the index of blog posts, those are things that are fairly easy to either cache or replicate to the edge. So um, Andrew, Andrew from the React team kind of talked today about the caching problem in, on, in, with React Server Components. We already have line of sight into that solution for the server. We also want to uh, solve it for the client to enable really rich resumption. Imagine applications like Linear uh, or Google Docs that are very client-centric and offline ready, but could also start up really fast from the edge because the data is already there. So kind of giving you this best of both worlds, really, really, really fast loads at the edge by having the data be available there, as well as resumption on the client to be able to hydrate and continue the experience in a very optimistic, local-first way. So long story short, I think, it really depends. We're going to give you the tools to be able to cache at the edge. We're going to give you the tools to replicate data as well. Uh, we have this capability already uh, in private beta called Edge Config, where think of it as, um, to, to give a very technically inaccurate metaphor, but imagine ETCD, but globally replicated and more relaxed consistency. But the idea is that Vercel itself takes some of that pain of the really hard work of having to replicate 
data across the world, but now you as a developer gain that confidence of, I can run compute confidently knowing that the state is there. I think the parallel with Kubernetes is that Kubernetes gives you that confidence of like, if, I, if they accepted my apply-f of uh, YAML spaghetti, Kubernetes will figure it out eventually. So no, no offense to, to Kubernetes. But so with us giving you things like edge config, you can now push data and policy to the edge that I remember it came up in one of the earliest conversations when you joined us as an advisor that you were excited about that ability to push both data and compute. Yeah, I think you know, we're starting to see people starting to talk about the forms of data containers. This concept that insert into the database where uh, GDPR compliance equals true, and the database now has a routing layer. All right, and then we're starting to take some of these concepts from HTTP because some of these data stores are backed by HTTP that they're also starting to think about federated data and compliance as a default. And so my prediction is that, just like we did for images, I think databases will go the way of CDNs themselves totally. and give us standard protocols on top. One thing I do want to make uh, aware, we have mic runners. So if you have a question, uh, if you raise your hand, one of the mic runners will come to you and you can ask your question, um, anything in our topics, or either me or Guillermo, and we'll answer that question. So we're gonna keep going. The other question I had was around security. Like when I first started trying to do uh, front-end work, and I have my you know, single-page web app, I know that's not what we're doing no more. There's someone here still doing that. <laughs> I'm with you. <laughs> Where do you put the credentials? If I have to talk to this back-end database or API that is in front of that database, or are we storing those credentials that give this privilege to the application tier like we're used to on the server side? Yeah. Or is that something we avoid? Well, the beauty of what we announced today with React Server Components is that as we go towards this uh, server-first, edge-first type of architecture, uh, I think naturally it lends itself better to security, right? Like you're not worried about the state leaking into the client. You're not worried about invalidating caches on the client when a permission gets revoked. Really, really, really hard problems about security we delegate those to the data clouds. We delegate those to the new modern databases that are coming to market. We delegate it to the API that represents your source of truth or your existing backend architecture. So I'm really happy that we're pushing for a model that has security built in out of the box. I think this is happening on several layers. Um, you know, you take React as the UI renderer. A lot of great defaults have gone into there to prevent categories of problems like XSS, it, it's hard. You have to really go out of your way with dangerously set inner HTML to like transform an incoming data stream into uh, HTML that can pwn you. So React already has that figured out. With React Server Components, we're also putting the logic on the server side. I mentioned also with Vercel, we have this ability to split your architecture into multiple functions, and whether serverless or edge functions and we can sort of contain secrets and environment to those functions. And because things don't run for long periods of time, I think it's also much, much harder to leak state across different requests or invocations. So I think this kind of modern architecture is doubling down on the concept of being secure by default. And, um, and developers now kind of really have to go out of their way to break the seal of, of the good defaults. And this is ultimately to your point earlier why most folks are not gonna wanna write frameworks from scratch, right? Or even bind the framework to service architecture from scratch because there are a lot of things that can go wrong from a security standpoint. How much does the developer productivity flow into this? I'm, I'm gonna share a story and the reason why I ask, you have some competing paradigms right now. We have no code and low code platforms. Um, I was remember teaching my daughter how to, you know, write some code, and I just started with HTML. And I showed her some HTML, and it's looking like GeoCities after about 45 minutes. Blinking tags are everywhere. I'm like, okay, you you <laughs> found some stuff. You're expressing yourself, and she's showing it off. And I remember she wanted her friend to see. One one two seven dot zero dot zero dot one. That's what she texts to her friend, and it doesn't come up. Yep. And she's like that. It's not working. And the proud father that I am, I was like, this is my moment. <laughs> I can teach her Linux, your Docker, Kubernetes. <laughs> I was ready. Like, it's about to, it's about to be a moment. Cops. Yeah, and I, and I thought about it, and I said, that would be irresponsible. 
And I remember letting her use, you know, your tooling where you just run one command and you get back this URL. Yep. And then you share the URL and the person clicks on it. And she's like, is this how it works? Is this what you do at work? I'm like, yeah. <laughs> So, so how much does developer experience flow into the decisions you make when you talk about convention over configuration? Because I saw this in the yeah. Rails world back in the day where you yeah. try to make sure the defaults were same. Yeah, this is where the, the idea of the framework dictating the infrastructure is really exciting. Because we can look at your code and tell you we're compiling this into this infrastructure automatically, right? So. In the case of a simple HTML page, Vercel would say, well, it's an HTML page. Immediately push it to the edge and return that URL automatically. So the developer didn't have to go through all this mental gymnastics of, I need a, uh, an Nginx pod. I need to provision 20 <laughs> Kubernetes clusters. I need an ingress controller. Like, and just, and well, I am. You got to be secure. <laughs> <laughs> and it's secure. And it's actually even more secure, right? Like, in that case, Vercel can say, well, there's no compute involved. We can statically prove it. So just ship it, just put it, which you have some pins. Um, so the next thing for us was like, okay, can we combine that static asset with a unit of compute? So now I can say, here's my static asset, here's my edge function. So the, the next thing was, okay, to your point about creating conventions that the entire world can build on, is how we arrive to this idea of the build output API. So Next.js takes some opinions about how you should structure your application. You saw all our glorious new opinions today with the app directory, and they're pretty good. Rich from Svelte agrees, so it must be right. Um, so you, you have that app directory, and, and Next.js will run this compilation process. So going back to the example of running Vercel in the CLI, we dispatch your inputs to the cloud, we build it, and we say, okay, it, it gets converted into this global resources. But you can also peel back the layers with the build output API, and you can say, okay, if I run a build, what, what is Vercel using? What, what is this turning into? And now framework vendors and authors can say, okay, I also want to target that common API. So that's how we've been able to integrate another 35 plus frameworks into the platform because there's this common set of build artifacts that they're all deploying. It's like our intermediate representation of this cloud compiler that we've built. So you kind of get the best of both worlds of the, the developer did very little. Now, okay, show me the magic. You know, show me what is, what is this becoming? What resources are you creating? What's the security of those resources? What secrets and environment do they have access to? So I'm really excited that there's technology that is making this possible. It's making your daughter now has a website that is so fast, you know, like her lighthouse scores are going to be off the charts, <laughs> which we should, we should tell her. We'll, we'll, run, we'll run some lab tests and some field tests. Um, but also, you get this ability to extend the platform. So, in fact, one, this was one of my inspirations, and I'm so proud to hear things like this, because we want to build something that's really good on day one and really good on day 1,000 where you know that the abstractions sometimes start competing a little bit. Like some of the ideas, the opinions are like, okay, but in this case that doesn't apply or I need to step out of this, I need to get more control. So Seb from the React team always talks about how a huge part of the design of React was considering the scape hatches. We talked about one with dangerously set inner HTML. There's another one which is a global called React, don't touch this or you will get fired. Some of you might have seen it. So there's all these escape hatches because the reality of the world is that it's actually very complicated. Uh, this is, I think, also part of the, the, how, how successful JavaScript has been. You can go in and overwrite anything. In fact, with MooTools, I think we overrode the string dot prototype so much that the standards committee could not use some of the names that we had polluted JavaScript with. So sometimes it can get out of hand. But the idea of having deep access and being able to bend it and adapt to your use case is something that has been a huge uh, part of our design philosophy. And, and it, it goes into this idea of turning developer experience into really optimal uh, behavior at runtime. So JavaScript tended to evolve along with the browsers. As the right. browsers added more capabilities, 
JavaScript and the frameworks got more advanced. And a lot of what I'm hearing you say, though, is will JavaScript try to evolve based on the infrastructure behind it outside of the browser? Are, are these two things now moving in lockstep? And honestly, what does that mean, though? Does that mean that we're going to start to see functionality that's only available in that kind of paradigm? Or what, like, what does that mean long term? I think what we're seeing with, with the browser being s such a, uh, an important part of the, the standard API of the world, we're seeing now with the modern runtimes like our Edge runtime that a lot of the APIs that you find in the browser are now the APIs that people prefer on the server. Mm. So in one of our slides today, we talked about having to juggle two sets of runtime APIs, Node.js on the server and the web-centered APIs in the browser. Folks that were coming from other environments like Java were like, why do I have to learn two runtime environments, two sets of APIs? I, I'm getting confused. So this is running where? That's what React Server Components is solving so elegantly on the runtime layer in the code splitting layer, because now there's a clear separation between a server component and a client component. So I think what we've been learning is the browser has tremendous influence in infrastructure and API design. And I think that's going to continue, right? WebAssembly. Again, that has the web word in it, but folks are excited about running it at the edge. Our new dynamic image generation capability is using WebAssembly because we need raw performance, we need to generate images, and we also want to run it on, on your device for, for the local experience and for portability. So I think the, your, your thesis, I'm gonna, I'm gonna run with it, of like the web is now the operating system for the cloud. We're seeing that happen on the runtime layer, API layer. We're seeing it influence the, the way that you ship these artifacts, right? Like this build output API might just soon be a bunch of dot .wasm files at, at the end of this all. So really excited about the convergent evolution of it all. I want to remind everyone in the audience, we do our taking live questions, so we're not gonna wait until the end. We'll have some towards the end as well. If you have any question on these things, I think there's a question up here. There should be a mic floating by. Um, introduce yourself, make your statement, and ask your question. We'll start up here, and then we'll go towards the middle. Hey, I'm uh, Chris Vejeu from Facebook, and uh, I'm working on Excalibur. And one of the things that's really good about like Versal, we're not using Next, but is like all of the code, all of the deploy, all of the like PR and everything is handled for us. But we still have one big uh, issue: is like the data, and. Are you thinking of like building something like Parse or like this kind of thing where like you can handle the data for me so I don't have to like think about it and we get like all of the best developer experience? So yeah. Yeah, for sure. So we continue to invest in this new modern data API bindings. Uh, I'm really excited about some of the new ones that are coming to market on like Planet Scale and Neon. They're giving you the flavor of data that you need. I think what, we, what we've seen with frameworks in the front end ecosystem we're also seeing with data APIs where folks don't have, there's not a one size fits all solution for data. So I gave the example of the edge config paradigm and the edge store paradigm where what you want out of that database is very precise. There's a reason that Kubernetes didn't use MySQL to drive its, its core metadata engine, right? They, they need something more specialized for, for that particular job. So I think the same is happening with, with the cloud uh, at large, right? Sometimes I might have gone to a raw database. Nowadays, I'm going to a content-oriented database, like a headless CMS. Sometimes I would have gone to you know, run, go and operate my own database. Now I'm going to serverless databases, like serverless MySQL or serverless Postgres. So I think what, are, what we're prioritizing first and foremost is embracing the ecosystem and then giving them the appropriate bindings to our world, where there is the ability to push data to the edge, or whether it's React Server Components bindings to make bringing data into your front end easier. So we continue to sort of listen to developers and, and, and answer their needs with, with that in mind, that there's a lot of complexity and uh, we, we should not be oversimplifying it. Yeah, so I'm gonna add something onto that question. So there's two trends I actually see. In the cloud world, we've seen for a long time of, of separating storage and compute and even the query layer. And so when you think about some of these you know, serverless databases, they tend to have an architecture. We kind of saw with object store first, like S3. You know, you drop it in the bucket and it tends to be replicated pretty much everywhere. And it feels like it's available everywhere else in the world, depending on what the SLA or the API is. But we're starting to see a similar thing. Some database protocols will support HTTP by default. Some SQL dialect will be in the body. Some people are just adopting Postgres. But if you look at the databases that they're sitting on top of, 
they tend to speak multiple protocols. You can either talk to them via HTTP, you can either talk to them via MongoDB, you can talk to them via the Postgres protocol. So I think if people are willing to give up how it runs, then you, what you'll be ending up with is this piece where there's just be a data protocol on top. And the last thing that I think is missing but we're seeing more of is federated identity. We gotta move away from username and password. I don't think that is going to be sustainable for what we need to do on the data side. But if you can get to strong identity, I can imagine an edge function having an identity and it could be a TLS, TLS ML, uh, MTLS certificate that has that service ID in it so that way you can just make a standard HTTP request somewhere else in the world, go to the right routing layer, and then use that to hang policy off of. You can query this data from this particular region or zone. So I do think that's where things are headed, and again, it's all predicated on all these data systems moving in the direction of the web. That point is also really exciting to me because there's, there's a kind of data that is very much data that you own in relationship to the application, then there is data that is shared among a set of users, and I think part of the trick is figuring out what are the right patterns to use for each type of data? And can the framework guide you towards those? Instead of, okay, I have the database and, and everything goes into it. And I think, to your point earlier, like there's data that is attached to a specific policy. I want data that it immediately makes my application GDPR compliant. I want data that is replicated at every edge, but it, some data is not. I want data that migrates with the user lifecycle. I want data that is attached to my session and migrates as, a, as I move uh, throughout the world. I've been thinking a lot about this as the world comes back and we've been flying a lot. My data, my, the state of my shopping cart, should that be replicated to every edge? Or sh is that something that I kind of carry with me, but still the edge that I'm nearby has access to? So these are the kind of things that we're thinking about now. And I think it's going to become very obvious as we start upgrading some of our examples, like Next.js Commerce to React Server Components. We're gonna start incorporating some of these more advanced requirements for very uh, uh, sophisticated UIs that blend dynamic data with cache data, with user personalized uh, state, and so on. And there's a question in the middle of the room. Introduce yourself, uh, ask your question. It's just on. Yeah, so Miguel here from MakeSwift. And you know, with all this talk about stateless, there's all this you know, simplicity and, and the promise of developer experience, but we talk about data and um, we know that there's this tension between configuration and, and ease of use and flexibility. And, and the kind of like big pink elephant in the room is truly in these distributed systems, the caching is, is what actually you know, comes into play. And so the invalidation of that cache in a distributed system like this usually kind of like, you know, some say it's one of the hardest problems in computer science. And so I'm curious when thinking about uh, propagating this data through, through the edge and invalidating cache when, when bringing in data, uh, the, the, what are the thoughts there and like some like new ways to approach those things to do it in a granular way that considers all these new complexities in the system? Yeah, I love that question because I mentioned earlier, oh yeah, some data will be cached at the edge. Uh, and, and if you hear that and, and I don't answer the other part of the story, is like how does that cache get updated? How does that cache get invalidated? So I think one of the things that's made Next.js so successful over the past few years is that we introduced this con concept of ISR. So the common wisdom when we introduced ISR was you can do static generation or you can do server rendering. So choose. And static generation will generate every single page at build time. And if you want to change, you want to fix one typo, you have to regenerate the entire set of, of pages. And you'll wait, you know, an hour. The other one was everything is dynamic. So WordPress, everything goes to a MySQL instance. And then if you get a lot of traffic, like, good luck. Like, you're, you have to scale your, your database in proportion to user traffic, and, and, and then you'll be spending a lot of money on databases. So how can we give you the best of both worlds? So with ISR, we said, okay, let's um, produce a set of pages at build time. We'll let the developer choose. And then at runtime, we can also use that same function that rendered it at build time. We can execute it at runtime. And now Vercel is in charge of, as you said, the hardest problem in, with engineering, which is you know, cache invalidation. Now Vercel can say, if the serverless function invocation that regenerated that page succeeds, I can push the invalidation to the edge. I can do it at basically the speed of light. So within 300 milliseconds in most regions in the world, you'll see your change. And I don't have to rebuild the entire application. But the granularity there was the page. That was the problem, right? Like you're still 
kind of static there. Like you have, you, you were able to make it more dynamic. You were able to change it at runtime. You didn't have to regenerate everything. It, we helped you a lot with the cache invalidation problem, but you still have that lack of dynamism. So the new, uh, which kind of hinted at during Delva's presentation is, can you do that in a more granular basis? Can you do it for each data dependency that makes up this desegregated component tree? So where Vercel can help you there as well is not just saying, okay, this data point changed, but also negotiate the subscriptions with our integrations of data services. So if I'm reading data from Sanity or Dato CMS, they can let us know, hey, this data point, this data tag has changed, and Vercel can handle the invalidation. So what's important there is to, again, like the developer to some extent has to think about consistency and not all data is created equal. So some data might, you might want to cache, some data you might not want to cache. But the, the nice thing is that you, we're putting you in control of that every time you read data from your server components. So it's still a big problem, but we're kind of like giving you all the right defaults and then all the right overrides to create very complex applications. Yeah, and it's probably good to understand why we started caching in the first place, right? Like you don't, we didn't have good replication to begin with. You know, some people this was a big stopgap because you were going to knock over your database server if you didn't have this. But now I think there's people that are thinking about data architecture day one, right? So maybe buying something new on an e-commerce site goes to the system of record and we'll take that right. slowdown of latency on the right side. But the moment that order has shipped, and we know that that can't necessarily change the state of that order ID, you're free to replicate that in a read-only fashion to as many locations as possible. So then you start to think about caching from a tier perspective. Yes, I can cache in the sense of HTTP, but I can also cache in the sense of the Postgres protocol being closer to that middleware and saying, hey, don't pull from HTTP cache. I still want you to make that query, but that database is now next to you. So I'm getting kind of the best of both worlds consistency, replicating my read-only stuff that shouldn't change for compliance reasons, and then I'm using the same protocol. And then, of course, you've seen it now in some clients. They can request a freshness in the query itself. Hey, I'm willing to wait because I want the latest and greatest from the system of record, and most people actually don't need that. So I think we're all starting to think about data architecture way more than we used to when we just put everything into yeah. one big database and help for the best. Yeah, sometimes we get the question of like, what is the right framework for a website? What is the right framework for a web application? Perhaps it's not as important of a question as asking what, what are the characteristics of the data? Can I cache here, can I not cache here? Is this sensitive, is this not sensitive? What is the policy that I need to apply to this specific data point that I'm bringing into the front end? Because I think, especially with Nexus <laughs> 13, the, the, the lines between like, this is definitely a website uh, and this is definitely a web app are getting blurrier and blurrier and blurrier. So it's more about availability of data and what is your uh, ability to ca or, or desire to cache that data close to the user. All right, there are more questions. We have a question up here at the front. We have two down here. Please don't throw the mic. Our policy doesn't <laughs> cover that. <laughs> Is this on? All right, so it's coming. Oh, so someone has a microphone now, raise your hand. There we go. Hi there. Hello. Uh, Amal Oves, VP DevRel at Rapid API. And I love the analogy of, you know, uh, your daughter sending the localhost URL. And uh, we, uh, my question is related to that, actually. We've gotten used to this super efficient way of debugging JavaScript, which is called console log. And <laughs> right? And my gut feeling is with React server components and we trying to make dynamic more of a part of this front end framework. Uh, what about dev tooling? What about a new developer quickly able to debug a uh, serverless or edge cloud function with something as simple as, I don't know, streamed console log or whatnot? Totally. Because I, I've seen it becomes super tough even from cloud to edge. I want to grab that one because when Kubernetes came out, this is the first thing people were worried about, right? You have a bunch of machines, you named them after your favorite My Little Ponies, whatever <laughs> your naming convention was, and you put your SSH key there. That's how Galactus. you know it's yours, right? And so you can just SSH to the server and do everything you want, even if you didn't have centralized logging set up. It's 2022 and some companies still don't have that. And, but you have the fallback, which is I can just log into the system myself and just pull the information I need. 
So when Kubernetes came out, the first thing we did was like take away SSH. <laughs> the node shouldn't be a first class primitive anymore. But then people asked that exact question. But think about the layers that are hard to debug. It's just because they don't really have APIs. We were writing to files. Think about that. Logs that you need to run your business were being written to a file. If you run out of disk space, the logs are gone. Like driving around the car with no gas meter. How much gas do you have? I don't know, but I think we're good. I'm out of space, sorry. I can hear it. <laughs> I think it's half full. And so in the Kubernetes world, we actually gave an API to logs. And so what you would do is you would deploy your app to the cluster. You didn't choose what server the app ran on, but you said kubectl logs, and you gave it the app name. And then Kubernetes would then stream the logs from standard out on the machine and give it back to you over an API. It would even give you a cursor. Give me the logs at this time. And once you start putting semantic meaning around these things that we use for debugging, then yeah, I mean, the, one of the goals of any distributed system is to take those pieces and hide them and make it look like one computer. So I think the tooling will adjust. I think these streams of debugging information will adjust. And just like a car has millions of sensors, they all know they're responsible for reporting to one dashboard. So I think in the future, those systems will feel like that going forward. Yeah. I love, once again, the analogy of moving to the web as the operating system because with, with Edge Functions, for example, we don't have access to Linux APIs. We don't have access to um, you know, file descriptors. We have the console global, so we have console.log, console.info, console.error, console.trace. And now, if Next.js gains the ability to comply with open telemetry, for example, and you're able to start instrumenting. So today, obviously, we take console.log and console.error, and we, we, we tr um, treat it as if it was a standard output and a standard error. But we can get more sophisticated in terms of giving you the ability to, to do traces. I think the question is really good as well, because what we're dealing with with this tiered architecture is that we got ourselves a, a more complicated problem in terms of debugging, right? And this is ultimately the beauty of React and the essential complexity that we're dealing with is code can run uh, at the edge, code can run on the client, code can run in the cloud or, or closer to your database. Uh, code can even run at build time if you choose to pre-render at build time. So now we got ourselves a, a more complicated distributed systems debugging problem. So I think it's really important that we continue to invest in the standards for how are all these libraries, how are all these modules, how are all these components reporting to standard tools that can process that information. So Vercel is already giving you out of the box things like monitoring. Uh, obviously, for the client side today, we, we announced uh, the acquisition of Split B. So we're, we take this problem, uh, the observability problem and the debugging problem as one of the really key problems to solve as you start going to serverless and edge because it's more of an ephemeral compute. Uh, you lost that ability to SSH quite a while ago. Uh, so you need that ability to be kind of retrospective in your analysis. Yeah, I mean, the first time I saw a request ID chained together, you know, through the load balancer, through your server, and today, of course, you have to propagate those things. I think we're learning a lot from distributed systems in general, and the web just happens to be one of the biggest distributed systems we've ever created. We just have to get meaningful about the semantic data. So console.log needs to add additional metadata. From right. what edge function are you logging from? What's that request ID that invoked this function and then honestly, you'll never want to go back to like running yeah. grep and said on your log system. I think we had another question here, so if we can pass the mic. Hi, Laura from IDC. I wanted to ask about the overall topic of you know, developer shortage, right? The uh, shortage of developer talent worldwide. And you know, some of that is a chicken and egg problem, right, with the complexity of development and back-end development, front-end development. Don't only want to pick on Kubernetes, but you know, it, there's that chicken and egg problem. Um, and of course, we want to enable developers to do their best work. So you know, thinking and curious your thoughts, uh, looking into the future, things like Next.js, Wasm, Vercel, what, what is your opportunity to really make a dent in that problem and you know, help companies get their talent where they need and you know, maybe end that shortage? I think we got to reclassify what a developer is. I think th there's this false conception that a developer is someone who writes code from scratch to build every idea that's asked of them. 
that doesn't make a lot of sense. Frameworks exist for a reason. As we learn over time, we should be creating frameworks and libraries to make it easier for new people to become a developer. I met a person who said they used to be a lawyer. I'm like, so what are you doing now? And this person is building flight instructor software. Okay, how'd you do it? I don't know, I went to this no-code place, I made a spreadsheet, I put it in the columns about what we need to keep track of our bookings, and I hit enter, and a mobile app popped out, a web browser app popped out, and now they have this full application that people who give private flight lessons build. That's a developer. And so I think a lot of times is when we start to see these transitions, right, of course, people don't necessarily have all the same skills, especially if you're changing various products versus fundamentals. And also there's this other part of what are we doing to the developers? Ever, I've been a developer for a long time. You join a company and you look at this code base, you're like, who did this? <laughs> I'm not sure how I can help. And so I think a lot of developers are saying that ain't the way anymore. It can't just be a free for all where there's no semantics, no framework. So I think a lot of developers are saying, I'm not coming here to write our own JavaScript framework. I'm coming here to build experiences for customers. And so I think if we were to step back, I've seen a lot of graphic artists move into web development and they build some beautiful experiences because they have context. So I think the world actually has a shortage of domain experts who can write code or build systems. That's where that next wave of developers are gonna come from. And trust me, they ain't gonna come in and start from scratch. Yeah, I love approaching the question from the point of view of what is a developer. And there are a couple of things that we're doing that I'm excited about that are starting to change that conception. So one is we introduced preview comments. So every time you, you push code to get, you get back this URL, it's your front end, you can share it. And now everybody in the company can say, I want to see something changed here. So that person is a developer. In fact, we talked about like what developers do a lot of the time is debug. So as a developer, I can go in and open this uh, page on mobile and say, look, it's not rendering right, or it feels too slow, or the copy here is not right. So that's one great way, I think, of getting more folks into the development process. And to, to his point, it's very product-centric. It's all about the customer experience. Like, how does this feel? What problem is it solving? Or arguably, that's the highest form of developer. And I think the other side of the, the answer is, um, with tools like Copilot and, and, and AIs suggesting code, we're starting to bl blur the lines between no code, low code, it's just me solving problems. And I think it's really exciting the trajectory that things are going. We also have folks here from companies like StackBlitz and Code Sandbox, but are helping us run these experiences in the browser. I think it's crucial for the learning process. That's the first thing that got me interested in the web. The web is the medium and the message. You can get in there and start coding from uh, Web Inspector, from the dev tools. And so continuing to lower the barrier of entry to get more folks interested, get more folks motivated to start making changes or suggesting changes, I think that's the winning formula. Yeah, and that example I gave about my daughter, I think I took the wrong approach of teaching her programming, like the inputs and outputs, like that is extremely boring. I was just sitting there like, what am I doing? This ain't fun. Having that visual feedback loop of you do something and there's a cause and effect, that's that motivation that has someone that goes away and wants to go and tinker some more. Teaching them JSON? <laughs> Who's Teaching, Jason? Yeah, like, yeah. <laughs> why is this person name on everything? <laughs> right, so I think starting at that layer is probably the wrong approach because a lot of their interactions with their systems are experience led. So I think that next wave of developers are gonna to wanna to be able to create experiences. Do we have some more questions? If you have a hand or you have a mic in your hand, there's a question there. Introduce there. yourself. We'll go here first and then we'll go there. Introduce Hi yourself there. and ask your question. Is this on yet? Yep. Good. Hi, I'm Sam Goff from Hewlett Packard Enterprise, HPE. And I'm fascinated by some of the changes you're rolling out today. Um, the granularity of the server side uh, rendered components as well as the data API. What I'm interested in is the security and the ability to handle the granularity of the cache or the not cache by design and how that intersects. And, and I think Kelsey was actually suggesting that we might be able to expect moving the API uh, accessing Postgre closer to the edge or into the edge. Correct. And, and I, I think really the question is, 
can you trust sensitive data in a cache, or do you always have to go back to the data base? And how do you see that changing in the near future? I can start with the way that we approach caching is extremely careful by default. So we have this approach uh, in Next.js that already existed called automatic static optimization. If your page doesn't require data or uh, you use get static props, you don't even get the input of the request into get static props. So that creates an extremely secure system. You can't, you can't even get data that is personalized to a certain identity. So Next.js can say, oh, I'm very confident. This can be turned into static HTML that is cached at the edge and shared by everybody. We're doing the same with React, uh, especially with the newer APIs, where if you read from a request, if you read a header, if you read a cookie, if you read anything that deals with that specific request lifecycle, that is a signal to the system that, hey, we're in dangerous territory, we should not cache at all. So that's one side of a very defensive and granular system to your point by default. The other piece that I'm excited about is that you can inspect all of your outputs. You can understand by running next build what is the output of, of bundling and what is the resulting set of instructions that are gonna get shipped. So that's the other opportunity to understand, okay, what is the system doing here? So recently we introduced a capability for edge functions to run in specific regions throughout the world. This is necessary because waterfalls are a thing. So I can have my compute running in uh, San Francisco, but if the data is in Vienna and I have a couple back and forths, so I made my app slower. So what we allow you to do now is you attach configuration and requirements on all of these entry points. So I can say, okay, pages API process payment has to run in a specific region and has this policy attached to it. And we can get more sophisticated with the policy. We can add rate limiting. We can add uh, defensive guards around caching, like never cache this. Uh, so we can, uh, over time, add a more and more control there, but the developer is also empowered to use the build output API to sort of um, do it themselves if necessary. Yeah, I think this is where data architecture is gonna be the new common skill set. Like, you know, when I think about writing an API, I tend to start with something like gRPC and protocol buffers. And I look at all of those fields and I ask a question of each of those fields. Is there PII data here? Where should it be stored? Now, we already move data through middle boxes because of the web. You, know, you never know how many proxies you're going through and we tend to encrypt that data on the way through. So it kinda, it's gonna come down to where can this data live at rest? A cache, in many ways, is just another data store where data lives at rest. Now, should we encrypt it and it becomes a blob? And then it becomes really interesting on how you display it. But I think when you think about components and that progressive nature that he talked about, I can show you that you've landed in your social security website, but I may not show you the details until you authenticate, Correct. and that inner component may make that long call to the system of record where things are end to end. So this is why I think, I mean, my first experience with this whole kind of React-based way of developing, the thing that got me super excited was the fact that you can be granular about where data is coming from at every element of the page. And I think the responsibility is to start moving away from this big JSON blob that has all the data about a user to more granular things. Like this is your profile data, and I'm gonna use a linking identifier to bring in this other sensitive data, but there's just two different components, two different paths, and two different requirements in terms of where data can be at rest. And the last thing I'll say here is, we kind of see this with like our streaming apps. We talked about Spotify and some of our conversations. In that case, that data is so huge, but we gotta remember what cache is these days. Your mobile phone is a huge cache repository. I think they say SQLite is like the most commonly used database. Yes. And so that's another area where a lot of this sensitive data is being cached in your banking app, in its own database, and maybe not that proxy that lives on the edge. And so this is why I think that data architecture, you have so many places to cache things at rest, you just gotta make sure you lay it out, and if you break it up and be modular, then you'll have that command and control that you need to pull this off. Uh, any more questions here? I think we have one there. Okay. Introduce yourself and ask your question. Hi, my name is Reka in Cisco. Uh, I started my career as like, a, I think ASP scripting 
great, you know, server side. And then we did ASP.NET, we did .NET API, we did Java API, and then I started somehow in a React group. And then I was like, oh, go goodness, only browser. <laughs> so I've been dealing with console log, and now it seems like we're com going back to the server-side component, server API, and we're going to start writing, API, writing APIs as web front-end developers. Uh, where do you see the ops group? Now we have like front-end group, ops group, API group, uh, three separate teams, and we lot of have a lot of API teams and a lot of front-end teams. Do you guys see with Next.js moving forward, ops and API and front-end all moving to Next.js platform? And like right now, our APIs are in Clojure, are in, I don't know what text they are using. Yep. So are, are you hoping all would converge into Next.js and Vercel, or it's going to remain distributed as in all the texts in the API will, you know, we have to deal with rate limiting, uh, CDNs, caching, uh, suddenly, uh, you know, it's not, uh, as more infrastructure is there, there are more problems. The server side problems are now coming to client side, I guess. So are you thinking server side people are coming to client side <laughs> next years? Yeah, um, so to start, ASP never really had a client model, right? So it was back in that world that I was describing earlier of, I'm gonna do a monolithic app, it's gonna out output some HTML with some templating library, and then when inevitably I need JavaScript to augment that page with animation, interaction, modals, et cetera, you bring in JavaScript. So I think what happened is that bringing in JavaScript over the years became more and more and more common because that's when a lot of the interesting things of an application, to the point about native apps, like a lot of the cool things that make a user happy happen on the client side. So I think that was kind of React's victory in my mind, is that they created this component model that can run on the server, can run on the client, and is giving you one common language in one common runtime to think about. Now I think in the beginnings of React, a lot of folks in the community over index on shipping all of the code of the client. And now I think the pendulum is swinging back to like, okay, like React server components, server first, and that's the way to scale. Now, where is React getting its data from? Is it getting it directly from the database and do I have to figure out all the rate limiting bits and all the security bits to your point? Not necessarily. It can get it, it can be a customer of that ASP.NET backend, for example. And Additionally, the front end team is empowered to add more logic. So I think it's almost like you get another vector, right? Another opportunity to put in compute and power there. A good example when you mentioned rate limiting is I hear a lot of folks love ISR because they're, they're customers of APIs where they're getting very little bandwidth in terms of API rate limits. It might be Shopify, it might be something else where they get a spike of traffic and they, they get rate limited and everything starts failing. And it turns out that that data was public in nature, so it could have been cached across user requests. So now, Vercel and Next.js are giving you that extra lever where you as a front-end dev can ascertain that the app will be faster and more available because you could introduce that extra logic there. And that also goes for API endpoints where you can define your own. So I don't think it's either or where you're gonna have a team that owns the entire discrete problem domain of API. I think we're also seeing the emergence of more and more APIs that you get uh, off the shelf and data APIs that you get off the shelf. So I think it's embracing the, the fact that we're in a very rich ecosystem. Uh, I think the language that powers a lot of those data APIs will remain an implementation detail. So it might be .NET, it might be Java. As long as it speaks a common protocol with your front end, I think it's fine. But we are going to see, I think, a lot more logic flowing into React now that people are gaining a lot more confidence in the server model they're more motivated to push logic to the edge and make their applications faster. So there is a certain amount of gravity toward the full stack React application story. Yeah, I think honestly everything you described, you know, there's this saying that uh, it's easy to predict the future when you're working on it. 
all the problems you're describing are just because of how these systems are all organically evolving on their own, and we have to stitch together everything in between. They're not really co-developed. So all of these workarounds that we're implementing, but over time, hopefully someone shows up and says, that paradigm should be in the protocol itself, right? Because at the end of the day, there's a set of human decisions you're making, and it's probably one around priority. How much priority should this person have to check their bank account? Well, if they've already checked it once, then we're gonna lower their priority because other people should at least be able to check their bank account once within an hour. That's really the rule that you wanna put in place. How do you express that today? Rate limiting, retry, there's a lot of things, but it doesn't say that. That's really probably what we want in these systems when we're thinking about a global customer base. We don't quite have the language to express policies in those terms, but at some point, we will actually have a framework that will allow you just to configure it, right? Because you have to have a lot of information about what your customers are doing at the same time in order to make those decisions and prioritize those requests coming through. And then security is another adjacent concern on top of this, right? What type of requests should you even be making as this user? Today, we put these checks everywhere. We put them in a load balancer, we put them in the application, Sometimes we forget to put them in the application. Then you're on the news for the wrong reason. <laughs> These things are super hard, and I think asking every developer and every framework at every layer of the stack to do this is not tenable. So as we move more into a declarative model or a convention-based model, I think what you're going to end up with is the ability to just say that. So in the, when I think about Next.js in general, it's probably a good example of a very opinionated model, not just how to write less JavaScript, about how to actually deal with these architectural concerns that we've all figured out over the last decade or so. And then for you to develop, or you would say, like a good concrete thing about image resizing. I under thought how hard a problem this is, right? You have some images. You put them in a directory and you serve them, right? So you serve all your cat pictures on your WordPress that your grandma hits, and you're sending her like 10 meg photos because your iPhone camera keeps getting better and now you're flooding her browser with all this unnecessary data. How do you actually resize these things on the fly? If you've never done it before, you're gonna be clicking on Stack Overflow a bunch, copying and pasting, you're gonna have all this, you're gonna download the whole internet and NPM dependencies to pull this off. Or a framework shows up and takes that exact pattern, that exact concerns, and just turns it into a library function. So I think we're just gonna always be chasing that type of thing where we try to put a new abstraction where the problem is. So is it gonna be Next.js? Hopefully. Yes. But I think every developer's responsibility is to take the knowledge that we learn and turn it into these plugins. And I think we're never gonna go back away from frameworks. So I think it's inevitable that that's the way we're gonna work in the future. There's a question here. Um, Alan from Trialabs, uh, loving the discussion, by the way. So connecting this that you just said with uh, the previous discussion on developers, um, how you're going to get people from different backgrounds, different skill sets, all contributing together to building applications and the abstractions that are going to be put by frameworks such as Next, what do you think are the leaky abstractions? I mean, do developers have to keep track of, like, my code is running on an edge, my, my code is running on the client, my code is running on the server, so where does it break? Where do I need to learn a little bit more about the details so I don't fall into pitfalls? Yeah, I think you, you already answered in a big way. I think having to think too much about location, leaky. Having to think too much about the exact characteristics of the runtime, leaky. I think the problem is that we don't yet have the tools to express things like the origin of the data, the confidentiality of the data, the lifetime of the data. I like to think a lot about the lifetime model of thinking in Rust. How can we apply that to caching, distributed caching, where a lot of the hard problems like invalidation can be very declarative in their definition. So until such time that we continue to sort of chase this ideal model and general theory of everything, we do have to expose some of those powerful knobs to you, but we try to make pretty well-informed decisions in the meantime. So I mentioned middleware is a good example where um, most of the time you're running logic that can be safely defaulted to being edge first. Now, if you start doing three waterfalls to an origin there with three fetches in a row, yes, like that, that might not perform so well. So we put some guardrails around that. 
we're also thinking a lot about uh, our cell intelligence layer that can sort of infer based on statistical data what backends you're hitting, right? So like when I hit api.stripe.com, is that global? Is that regional? What does it mean for that to be global? So there's a lot we can do to sort of help automate some of these hard jobs. But ultimately, I think, to your point, these things have to be very much um, essential to the problem domain. They have to express the business problem as well. They can't just be, I want the rate limit to be a, a constant called 100 RPS. No, that's not what we're trying to do here. And I think bringing the concept of the user and the identity into the, into the equation is going to help a lot. To the point about SQLite, the reason that SQLite is so popular is because it's this massively distributed, sharded by default, cheap and really high performance database. But the assumption is we can kind of understand that the scope of the data is the user. It has the, I, the authorization model of face ID. Uh, it can be encrypted at rest. And it has whatever amount uh, Tim Cook has designed as a default uh, space for your iPhone. So it's easy to reason about that. And that's why it proliferates. So if we can make every data interaction as easy to reason about for the developer, declarative and automated, I think we're going to end up in a really good place. Yeah, I think we're, we're, we just keep leaking the machine. It's just the number one problem, right? Like when you're on a Linux server and someone says you need to create SC Linux policies to tell the kernel what system calls that you can and can't make. It's kind of backwards. I don't yeah. know what all the systems calls are to express you which ones should or should not be made. And so what we really want to do is to say, hey, my app should only behave in this way. This data should come in. This is the response that should go out. And then you should ideally tell me what system calls are necessary to facilitate that. Anything else is a violation and shut it down. We're a long way from that. Yeah. But as we decouple these systems from the machine, again, object store is one of the best examples. You know, I work at a cloud provider. And when we think about storage, we had all these tiers, and they were based on pricing. Right? If you want cold storage, you pay this fee. If you want something that's active, you pay this fee. But look, how do you decide? Because a new system, the data is going to be hot, so you want to have it there. You're not going to remember to move it to the cold storage because you have no idea when to do that. And so now what these systems are doing, instead of being simple input, output things, you can now take the data, now decoupled from the system, and say, this piece of data, I'm OK if it's not access once in the last 15 days, just do the most cost efficient thing. And my SLA is, at worst case, I'll take 500 milliseconds. That's a better expression than pick a region and a zone, right? That, that's, that's not tractable. So I, I honestly think that we're going to combine what we, user intention with policy will equal configuration. And these systems, and you're already watching them evolve. Because whenever you interact with one of those systems, it feels like magic. Right? You put thing into place, and you put the policy, and the right thing happens. That's the evolution that these systems are undergoing now that we're starting to decouple from the machine. We're not talking about servers leaking their um, semantics all the way through. We're talking about computation. I love the idea of the system kind of evolving with regards to the intent of the user. So something that I love about serverless and edge technology is that it's very much at the, the provisioning of infrastructure and the usage of resources is a function of, no pun intended, is a function of traffic, is a function of users actively using your application. This goes also into the design of Next.js, right? The pages that get code split and turn into functions, some will be hotter than others. Some will take more memory and CPU somewhere in some data center in some location than others. And you're not constantly, th constantly there regulating that provisioning. You're not scaling the replica set or, or the deployment because you're like, oh, this part of the application is hotter now. Let me go and change it. And it's also very granular. So that's an interesting thing as well. When you create monolithically, you end up with this container that is say, okay, like I need it in, I need a thousand copies of this. And you're making a thousand copies of everything, even the parts of your application that are deprecated and not used. So if we can continue to evolve systems this way, where the behavior of the infrastructure is a function of the utilization and the user demand, I think it naturally self-regulates and, and is, ends up in a better place. Yeah, and we're still leaking the concept of the reality that there are finite resources. There's finite resources on the network. There's finite resources on the server. 
And in the Linux case, you have virtual memory that creates a great illusion that there's almost infinite memory, especially you use like, you know, some scratch space or something like that. But I think that scarcity is the thing that leaks, and this is why we do all this other stuff to work around that, because we can't express intent. I think we have question time for like maybe two more questions, and then we'll start to wrap. So if you had a question, we have one here. Uh, so if there's a mic here, we'll start here, and then we'll go here. Uh, introduce yourself, and I'll ask your question. Uh, hey, um, Rachel Lee Neighbors. I am over at AWS, and uh, I'm actually, I, I used to work on React Docs too at a time. Uh, so I'm hearing so much about the awesome open source origins of so many of the, the things that Vercel and Next are bringing to the, the front end community today. And a lot of big companies do open source and a lot of individuals do open source. And I'm really curious about what Vercel is doing, Vercel and Next are doing with open source uh, and how it's different from how open source has been done in other places. I think one key thing about Vercel is that as a business, it, we're providing collaboration, workflow, and infrastructure software. So our investment in open source is a function, okay, like what are those tools that we wanna give every developer that makes using global services like ours easier, more efficient, that they can collaborate, that they can create when they're inspired. So when we th work on things like TurboPack, is try to think about, okay, like what can we bring to the world that makes people collaborate in real time more easily? And do we want it to be Vercel only? No. Do we want it to be Next.js only? No. So we try to be very intellectually rigorous with, is this a component that needs to exist, first of all? Yes, because we have this opportunity. We can make it 10, 20, and even 700 times faster than existing technology. So number one is, that does this have to exist? We, d we do understand from a lot of experience in open source that open source is a commitment. It's a commitment to maintenance, to community building, to taking care of issues, to educating, to um, growing awareness of this thing, to maintaining it, to growing an ecosystem around it, to creating APIs for plugins. So we take that very seriously because it's, it's a 10 year commitment to maintenance. Uh, and the other part is also the bringing everyone along in the journey. So we, we specifically launched TurboPack as uh, its own website today, for example, because we wanna make it an open API for everybody to use. We've, we've learned from previous um, uh, experiences that trying to bundle things together don't really make sense. It's not gonna go far. So when we put out SWR, as an example, we said, this is a React component that anybody can use. And we treat Vercel's APIs the same way. Next.js is one particular way of using Vercel. And there are many others. In fact, Vijux uh, was just saying that for Excalidraw, he uses something else, which shall go unnamed in the context of this conference, but uh, at VercelConf. Uh, so we try to be very, very open, intellectually rigorous, um, API driven, API first, I think that's a very important point as well. Another th big thing I think um, Tobias uh, from Webpack has taught us numerous times is that architecture trumps code many times. I think it's, it's exciting to say TurboPack is written in Rust, Rust has a crab emoji, I, I like it, but the architecture being different I think is really, really exciting. So I would encourage more open source authors who, when they, they're thinking about their readme, and they're thinking about like why it exists, how it's faster, et cetera, why is it architecturally unique? I think that's a, an interesting thing that, uh, that we're bringing to the table now. And I don't know if you can really be successful anymore without an open, especially at the infrastructure layer. Number one, you're always competing with this community of people who are free from profit restrictions, organizational restrictions to experiment with something new. And if that experiment pays off, their chances of wild adoption are much better than most closed source implementations these days, right? When that idea spreads, especially if it's solving real problems, it's hard to compete with that. And honestly, I don't know if you can actually come up with all the solutions by yourself, right? You only have so many people awesome. working on this thing. You need that, that broader community in many cases to keep it sustainable. Uh, I think we have one more question here. Hi, uh, Adi Osmani, uh, the Chrome team at Google. Um, so one of the large open challenges on the web today is A-B testing and experimentation. Um, I'm kind of curious with the talk of server components and how much edge computing can help here, 
do you see a world where things like A-B testing become easier and how does Vercel think about solving it? For sure. I'm, I'm longing for that world. I'm living in that world today mentally. Um, so I think the idea of mo flipping the switch from I'm very confident about my next move to I'm very curious and experimental about my next move is extremely important that developers undergo. So we call it sometimes the transition from thinking of as a developer or a confident developer to more of a curious scientist. So I think there is something to the culture that needs to evolve. And not everyone has in their mind that everything should be an experiment, a flag, an A-B test. Uh, so we sometimes talk about how the idea of a code review became a popular meme. Like we all do code review. We all try to do pull requests and branches. But that was not always the case. So the idea of, OK, we should all agree that this is how we should develop, that the unit of collaboration needs to transition to being an experiment or a flag. The framework can do a lot to help there. So giving you framework primitives that help you represent those initiatives in your code. The architecture is already favoring this transition, I think, because we're putting more code on the server. I always like to picture the server and the cloud as this gigantic thing that can store lots of code, lots of functions, lots of permutations, and the client is this lightweight, thin, fragile thing that should get only the exact version that is necessary. So I think we're, we're moving things in the right direction to take advantage of that asymmetry of power, energy, compute, and efficiency, and availability of caches, and, and bring to the client exactly what they need, and empower th folks on the product design, marketing side to be more, I think also um, fearlessly experimental. I think a lot of us also want to be experimental, and then we're like, ah, this is going to make the website slower. This is going to introduce layout shift. So uh, bring in harmony to all those teams to, to push in that experimental uh, direction. All right, we're going to start wrapping this up. I think one thing that I have in mind is, you know, Next 13 just shipped. What's coming in 14? When you think about that roadmap, <laughs> no pressure. Ship it. Ship it. That's how the iPhone does, right? The 13 comes out, well, I'm waiting for the 15. Yeah, so the number one thing, the, the, the most obvious one is uh, we have a long way to go to stabilize these technologies. We want you all to start trying them and incrementally migrate your code bases, but TurboPack, for example, is in alpha. So we, we take stability really seriously. We take security really seriously. So uh, we want to make sure that the foundations are right. Uh, we want to continue to align ourselves with React in, in shipping uh, improvements to React that, that make all of this possible. Um, I think on the, on the infrastructure side, really, exciting about, uh, really excited about streaming. So stay tuned for, for more news in, in, in this side of the world soon. But as we continue to ship everything to the cloud and, and begin streaming as your data becomes available, things are changing on the runtime layer to make this possible. So we continue to evolve the infrastructure together with the framework. Um, so I encourage everyone to, to go to nextjs.org slash 13, try it out. Give us feedback, and um, and we'll, we'll reserve 14 news uh, to to a coming conference. Awesome! Hey, thank you all for hanging out with us. Thank you.